right, a fast moving wave of the Omicron variant shows the potential to crest. And confidence in putting the two year pandemic behind us is finally renewed. But where we go from here is still uncertain, leaving the medical community and public officials with the delicate balance of protecting public health while minimally disrupting society. And many of us are wondering is there an end in sight? Good evening and welcome to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. Joining us tonight, as always, he's been with us over the past two years, world-renowned Dr. Jeffrey Gold, the Chancellor of the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And later, we're going to welcome tonight's special guest, Dr. Sue Nuss, the Chief Nursing Officer at Nebraska Medicine. She's going to join our conversation tonight. And we hope you will as well. You're a big part of the show. In just a few moments, we'll open up our phone lines and take your calls. But first, Dr. Gold, now that holiday gatherings are in the rear view, how widespread is the virus around the world tonight? Well, thank you, and it's great to be with you this evening. Uh, why don't we just go straight into the graphics and start to talk about what the most recent numbers have been and the directions that we're going in. If we look at the worldwide data, we see that we're well over 300 million confirmed cases and over 5.5 million deaths over 2.3 million confirmed cases worldwide just yesterday and over 6,000 deaths. That's over 200 percent increase uh, over the 14-day running average. And when you look at the map worldwide, uh, you can see that this is increasingly not only Western and Eastern Europe, the Scandinavian nations, uh, Australia, uh, but also still increasingly so parts of South America. Uh, and South Africa, which, you know, we were so concerned about just a few weeks ago, seems to have gotten over this Omicron spread and markedly reduced their case transmission rates and therefore their hospitalization rates. If we look at the United States, it's somewhat of a different story. Uh, over 60 million confirmed cases, 677,000 confirmed cases just yesterday. That's a 215 percent increase over the last 14-day uh, average. Over 130,000 Americans hospitalized. We'll look at that in the near future, uh, which an 80 percent increase. And uh, just over 1,500 confirmed deaths, up 16 percent in the last 14 days, uh, recognizing that we've lost over 836,000 Americans confirmed to have lost their lives uh, to COVID since the beginning of this pandemic. As we look at the map of our nation, uh, there is almost no state that is free from that, including Alaska and Hawaii. And unfortunately, the yellows have turned into oranges and ambers. The ambers have turned into red, and the red continues to turn into dark purple, uh, tremendously due to the Omicron spread uh, across our nation. When we look at the states uh, across the country, you see Rhode Island uh, at 413 uh, cases per 100,000 per day, still remains to be one of the largest spread uh, in the country. However, New York, New Jersey, the United States Virgin Islands, Massachusetts are all over 250 cases uh, per 100,000 per day and still very much on a dramatic upswing. If we look at the shape of this curve more carefully, you can see that we're now having more cases uh, per day as a seven-day rolling average than we have ever seen since the beginning of the pandemic. And by the way, we are testing less than we have tested in a long period of time. If we look at the seven-day uh, rolling average over the last 90 days, that's the same curve just expanded for the last three months, uh, you can see that we've had days where we have exceeded one million one million confirmed cases per day, just an astounding uh, number of COVID, largely uh, due to uh, the Omicron variant. Washington, D.C., uh, New Jersey, Delaware, New York, Ohio, extremely high hospitalization rates, most over 60, 70, even over 100 uh, hospitalizations uh, per 100,000 uh, at any given time. And as have we have continued to predict uh, on this program, and as have many others, the purple bars on this graph continue to rise, representing now being more than 90 percent Omicron uh, variant uh, in the United States. If we look at the map of the 10 uh, health care districts of our nation, you can see that only my district, District 7, and uh, 
District 1, which is the northeastern part of the United States, have anything more than single digit uh, of anything other than Omicron. Indeed, for us, it's Delta, and I'm sure that's true uh, for uh, uh, Region 1 as well. Uh, in the northeastern part of the states. However, even in our region here in Region 7, uh, we've gone from 25 percent to 50 percent to 75 percent Omicron in literally uh, under a 14-day period. So this is unquestionably an Omicron pandemic at this time. And when we look at U.S. hospitalizations, we are almost at our all-time high. You may recall we peaked at about 135,000 hospitalizations uh, previously back almost exactly a year ago. And over the course of uh, up to yesterday, we were at 130,000. I'm going to guess, Christina, that when we look at these numbers tomorrow, they will unfortunately have reached, if not exceeded, the previous peaks uh, of a full uh, year ago. When we look at deaths per 100,000 per day, uh, you can see Delaware, Wyoming, Indiana, Pennsylvania, Michigan, parts of the country that have had a tremendous amount of Omicron and albeit a much less severe infection, just because of the pure numbers, we're seeing more hospitalization, more intensive care use, and tragically uh, more mortality. Our intensive care units across the country mirror the density of cases uh, that we've been seeing uh, reported. And when we look at the deaths per day, uh, of course, the Delta peak occurred in early October, late September. It then continued to fall down, of course, not getting anywhere near close to the seven-day average that we had back in February and January of last year because we had the successful uh, rollout of all of these vaccines. But unfortunately, the data now starts to show that the numbers are rising of death across this country. A recent projection that came to us from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention looking at the projected case fatality rates uh, for COVID, indeed almost exclusively due to Omicron in the United States, you see going back to November, December, and even early January, we were running at about 10,000, between eight and 10,000 uh, deaths per week in the United States. And unfortunately, the current projections are that within the next several weeks, we'll be at about 15,000 uh, deaths per week, 20,000 up to a range that could be as high as 30,000 deaths per week or three times uh, where we are right now. Now, we still have an opportunity to blunt that curve, but all things unchanged, these are the current projections from the Centers for Disease Control uh, and Prevention. If we look at some of the counties across the United States, for almost a year and a half, Christina, these were small rural counties. But now, Miami-Dade, New York City, Nassau County in New York, large, dense urban centers are showing case rates over 440, 480, up to 573 uh, cases per 100,000 uh, per day, unprecedented numbers uh, that we have not seen. So this is a look uh, at the mortality rates due to pneumonia, influenza, and COVID are going back not one or two, but going back four years in the United States. And you can see the vacillation due to the annual influenza peaks across our nation. But what you can also see is that over the last nearly two years now, the light blue peaks have really dominated the mortality rates from the National Center for Health Statistics Mortality Surveillance. And that is exclusively, or nearly exclusively, uh, due to the mortality seen by COVID. And tragically, we appear once more to be uh, on the uptick, well above uh, the baseline. Now, there's some data that I wanted to share, particularly about Omicron, just to make sure that our audience is well informed. We know that the infection itself is less severe. That is to say, the incidence of hospitalization, particularly for a fully vaccinated or a boosted individual, is much less than it was for Delta. But we also know that the Omicron variant is at least twice, if not as much as three times more transmissible. And that transmission rate is critically important in hospitalization, particularly in the immunocompromised and particularly in the older population. If you look at this data from uh, New York, uh, and I think it's really telling 
because New York has had the early experience, yet one more time, of rapid, rapid transmission of Omicron variant. And what it, this shows is that if you accelerate the ICU use curve by 14 days because intensive care unit hospitalization is a lagging indicator to case count, and if you accelerate the mortality curve, the death curve, by 21 days from the time of infection because the death rate is also lagging to not only ICU care, of course, but to cases, you see that they're almost superimposable. So the sheer number of cases that we're seeing, in spite of the lower morbidity and mortality of an individual case, is feeding tremendously high death rates and ICU utilization across New York State and now across the country. And again, this is shown here in this graphic uh, looking at hospitalization compared to last year's peak. So last year's peak, let's say it peaked at 100 percent almost exactly a year ago on January 1st, 2021. Uh, ventilation has not reached that level, uh, but it's about halfway there at about 50. Intensive care unit is three quarters of the way there, and hospitalization is almost at 150 percent of what last year's peak uh, looked like as of last night. Critically, critically important data. And of that hospitalization, we have to remember that the overwhelming majority are still unvaccinated individuals. Indeed, there's a 36-fold benefit of being vaccinated and even more so of being boosted of staying out of the hospitals per 100,000 uh, per day in New York City. So meaning, Christina, that even in the setting of high-density Delta variant and now replaced by Omicron variant, uh, the vaccines and the boosters are still producing a tremendous protection from being hospitalized, uh, being put into critical care, and losing your life to this disease. So uh, a lot to talk about tonight, some recently breaking news uh, from uh, the, our federal government in many areas, a recent report uh, from Cyprus as well about a potential new variant. So I look forward to answering your questions and most importantly to answering our questions and hearing our comments from our audience this evening. Well, I'm sure some ears just perked up when you said potential new variant. So we will get there within the next few moments. I'm sure you want that addressed right away if you're joining us tonight. But let's start with some of that breaking news that you're talking about. We always like to cover the news of the day as it relates to the pandemic on this program. Today, the CEO of Pfizer announced that the Omicron vaccine will be ready in March. They have a new one and the company's already manufacturing doses. And a fourth vaccine dose was approved for vulnerable individuals. Are we all going to need a fourth dose, Dr. Gold? You know, I think this is going to be very similar to what we saw, you know, six months ago, eight months ago, ten months ago. When we started rolling these vaccines out a full year ago now, almost exactly, I got my first dose in the very end of December of, uh, you know, a year ago, a little more than a year ago. Feels like forever, by the way. Uh, I can barely remember the day. I only remember my major event following it, which was sheer joy uh, and a sense of, wow, we're really going to solve this problem. Uh, but in answer to your question, Christina, I think for the most vulnerable, meaning those that are immunocompromised and those that are of an older age group, those that live in, in uh, congregate living, think long term care facilities, our prisons, I think some of our frontline workers such as healthcare workers, uh, the meatpacking facilities, uh, are some perhaps our teachers. I think we are going to do that. Whether that will be for everybody, a lot will depend upon when we see the end of this Omicron variant spike, which I'm hoping will be by mid to late February, if not early March, and what potentially follows it. Now, if, if we stay where we are and the numbers continue to fall, <clears throat> I guess we will have these new vaccines, and by the way, not just made by Pfizer, but made by Moderna and made by other manufacturers across the country, and we'll use them in a scientifically driven way. If we see other variants, you know, you've got to ask the question of how many variants can we continually manufacture booster doses for, and at what point we may want to think about changing the strategy to either a different type of vaccine, a broader efficacy, or perhaps more of a focus on the early treatment of the disease rather than the vaccines. 
Okay. Well, you know, you brought something to our attention. We really need to take Omicron seriously. We know that the number of fatalities associated with the Omicron surge are lower than we saw with Delta. That is a blessing. But what I'm concerned about is the rising number of children in the hospital right now. Since kids get sick all the time, how do you know when to take a child to the hospital? What signs should we be looking for there? Sure, and uh, you know, you're exactly right. We continue to see more and more pediatric hospitalization. Interestingly, uh, and I guess not too surprisingly, that those that are under five years of age who have not been eligible for vaccination, uh, that are in early childhood programs or in uh, pre-K or in kindergarten, as you know, the audience may know, I have grandchildren that are in that age group as well. Fortunately, they are fully vaxxed. They told me they wanted to be first in line uh, for vaccination uh, that lasted until they were first in line and then there were some momentarily second thoughts there but they're very proud of the fact that they're uh, fully vaxxed but yes uh, you know the early warning signs of course are fever cough uh, runny nose you know the typical things that we would see in young children uh, in uh, early childhood programs in kindergarten first grade etc and we just have to be very aware of the fact now that there's a tremendous amount of Omicron variant going around our school systems. And so if uh, a child develops some of these symptoms, particularly if they've had a high-risk exposure to an adult that's been infected or another child, <coughs> excuse me, uh, they definitely uh, need to get tested. And it can be a home point-of-care test or uh, it can be a PCR nasal swab or saliva test. Any of those will work. And until, you know, they get a negative test, they really need to be kept home from school or child care. Uh, and those siblings, by the way, uh, need to be treated the same way. Obviously, uh, we do want to keep our children in school. We know how important that is to their educational journey, to their socialization and maturation. But at the same time, we want to keep them out of the hospital, of course, and we want to stop the spread of COVID. It's really tough right now because everywhere you go, whether it's the grocery store, the post office, somebody's sneezing or sniffling or coughing, it seems. And it's tricky because right now the seasonal flu is going around as well as COVID. Is it possible to get both simultaneously? There have been a number of reported cases of COVID and the flu, unfortunately. Uh, and indeed, you know, unlike last year where influenza was almost unheard of, uh, in hospitalization and in outpatient clinics. Unfortunately, we are seeing across the United States a good deal of it. There was a very significant outbreak in Michigan not so long ago, but even in some of the surrounding states to us here, parts of the East Coast and the West Coast, there have been some outbreaks, particularly uh, for the uh, so-called H3N2 variant of flu, which uh, unfortunately was not terribly well covered in flu vaccine this year. So uh, the predictions are that we're going to see more flu. We're seeing a good deal of RSV, respiratory syncytial virus, in children. And so you look at hospitalizations uh, in our children's hospitals uh, across the United States now, the number of uh, pneumonia-like situations, do either due to COVID, RSV, or due to uh, the flu, uh, are really running at all-time highs with longer stays uh, and more severe infections. And unfortunately, for those that have had COVID, we're starting to see even more of what's called the long COVID or what we used to call the long haul syndrome from COVID. So a lot of concern about that as well and good reason to have early warning signs, early testing, and then trying to keep our kids from spreading COVID or getting COVID from others. Oh, absolutely. Okay, before we go to break, as promised, I do want to ask you about this potential new variant that many of us are hearing about. What do you know about it so far, Dr. Gold? So very preliminary information. Uh, it's been nicknamed Delta Cron, uh, meaning a hybrid between Delta variant and Omicron variant. 25 cases uh, were reported uh, from uh, the Greek uh, part of the, United, of the world to the World Health Organization as a, quote, variant of interest, not yet of concern, small numbers. First of all, <clears throat> the final science on this, is it really a hybrid between Omicron and Delta remains to be determined, uh, although genetically it has characteristics of both of these viruses 
and so that's why it was given the nickname of Deltacron. But what it means in terms of transmission rate or case severity uh, remains to be seen. So if it has the lower transmission rate of Delta uh, and the higher safety rate of Omicron, it would be a welcome addition. If it has the higher transmission rate of Omicron and the higher severity and illness rate uh, of Delta, then that would be really bad news for us. But right now, you know, 25 cases does not make a variant of concern. So this is something that people are tracking very widely uh, right now at the World Health Organization and elsewhere, and more to come in the near future. My guess is the media is going to be filled with this over the next several days as we learn more and more about it and find out from the Cypriot health organizations uh, in Greece uh, as to what the rate of spread is and how much severity. It is unfortunate, though, that half of these cases, as I understand it, uh, were detected in hospitalized individuals. Uh, it may just be a sampling artifact, but if 50 percent of these people are getting hospitalized, that would be also of considerable concern. Wow, absolutely. Okay, we're not done yet. We know that much. Stay with us. We are going to pause for a quick break, but before we do so, we want to open up our phone lines to your questions tonight. The number to call is 877-731-6733. That number again is 877-731-6733. Call in with your questions, and when we come back, Dr. Sue Nuss, who serves as Chief Nursing Officer at Nebraska Medicine, she's going to join our conversation tonight. We're going to take your calls as well right after this. Stay with us. More Rural Health Matters next. Welcome back to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. We're glad you're with us tonight. Joining us once again, world-renowned Dr. Jeffrey Gold, the Chancellor of the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And now we welcome Dr. Sue Nuss, who serves as Chief Nursing Officer at Nebraska Medicine. She wears a lot of hats. Now, Dr. Nuss has more than 36 years of nursing experience, including 25 years in pediatric oncology and 11 years in nursing administration. We really value your time. We thank you for joining us. And we've heard about the potential for burnout among health professionals, probably since March of 2020. It's been ongoing, and now we're almost two years into it. How is our healthcare workforce holding up at this juncture, Dr. Nuss? Well, Christina, thank you for having me, by the way. And I would say that all healthcare providers, not just nurses, are definitely fatigued. It's been a long couple of years. We didn't think that it would go on this long, but they're battling as best they can. They're still wanting to take very good, compassionate care of our patients, but they're definitely tired is how I would describe it. You know, when we go over the statistics, we know that these are not just numbers, especially to our nurses. You've seen the faces, you've held the hands of real people, real families impacted by the virus. How does that impact you in your personal life? Well, I would say not just even me, but all of our nurses. What's challenging right now is that we come to work and deal with these patients, help to take care of these patients on a daily basis. And then when we go home, our family members and our friends are asking us for information. And we watch the news, we watch TV, we read online, and COVID is everywhere. So we're having trouble disconnecting. It's hard to get away from COVID. And so we're really just helping to support each other as best we can, um, trying to find the light at the end of this very dark, uh, long tunnel. But uh, I do think that we'll get there over time. I'm happy to hear that. Uh, can you remember, though, in your professional career, can you recall a time when our health system has ever been as heavily stressed for this long? In my nursing career, no. I do not remember anything that's been this this um, longstanding. We've certainly had incident incidents, and we've had situations occur. We've had tragedies, but never has anything lasted this long that I can remember. <sighs> I, we will all look back on this, and we'll have so much perspective going forward. But right now, we're all still in the thick of it, and we all just want to thank you, our entire medical community out there. Thank you for what you've done for our family members throughout this pandemic. Okay, as promised, we're going to go to the phones now. Victoria of North Carolina is our first caller tonight. Thanks for joining us, Victoria. Go right ahead. Thank you for having me. Um, this question is for Dr. Gold. 
I had both vaccines, Pfizer vaccines. Last one was May the 6th for my second one. And now I have COVID. Do I still need to get a booster vaccine? Yes, Victoria. Uh, first of all, thanks for calling. And I hope that the COVID case that you have is not severe. Uh, but, and there's no question that it's going to be less severe because you've had your full sequence, primary sequence of vaccines. Uh, you know, the uh, Centers for Disease Control or Prevention have changed the language a little bit from fully vaxxed to up to date on your vaccines. And up to date on your vaccines mean that if you've had one of the mRNA vaccines, either Pfizer or Moderna, even if you've had COVID before or after that vaccine cycle, that you should get a boost if you're within six months of Pfizer or Moderna or if you're within two months uh, of the J&J &J vaccine. And if you've been within two months of the J&J &J vaccine, uh, the current recommendations are, are to have one of, of the other, one of the mRNA, Pfizer, or Moderna boosters. Now, if you currently have COVID, m most of the physicians that I know <clears throat> are recommending about a 30-day interval after you've recovered uh, from the COVID. Uh, and so, you know, most people will take a good five to seven days before their symptoms go away, perhaps a little bit less with Omicron, particularly if you have a mild case of it. Uh, and so when you're sort of feeling yourself, that's when it's time to schedule uh, your boost. And that will prevent uh, not only yet another case of, uh, of COVID, uh, but that will also continue uh, to keep people out of hospitals, to keep you from having an asymptomatic case, and by the way, shedding virus and infecting others, which of course I'm sure you don't want to do. All right, thank you so much for that call, Victoria. Next up is Robert of Missouri. Thanks for joining us, Robert. Go right ahead. Uh, yes, uh, I'd like to know, uh, since the virus requires energy to reproduce, would the elimination of sugar and corn, raw sugar and corn syrup uh, reduce the ability for it to reproduce and therefore does keep you warm and I mean keep you well and the second part is does the mRNA vaccines do they interfere with your normal DNA so uh, two good questions and uh, important uh, to discuss uh, first of all the uh, the the carbohydrate uh, indeed, your diet itself uh, has got very little to do with the ability of virus uh, to replicate. Unfortunately, you're absolutely right. The replication process does take energy, but that derives it from our cells that get infected. So there are cells in our respiratory tract, in our nose, throat, uh, in our airways, and in our lungs provide the energy uh, to all viruses, bacteria, fungi uh, that uh, ultimately uh, do uh, infect us. Uh, the answer to your second question is the mRNA vaccines and the virus vector vaccine that we have in the United States, J&J, &J, has got no impact on our DNA that we are aware of. Uh, the DNA in our cells is quite stable and indeed uh, the use of an RNA, uh, um, mRNA, messenger RNA vaccine uses our cells metabolism to create protein that looks like certain parts of the virus that then we make antibodies to. So it requires intact DNA and intact cellular function in order to be effective. And so to the contrary, our DNA is well protected. Uh, and that has got, that's particularly relevant also uh, to individuals who are thinking about starting a family, both men and women. We want to be very sure that our DNA, if we're interested in starting a family uh, or during the time of pregnancy or breastfeeding, is completely protected. And the answer to that question is that all of the data we have to this point indicates that that is the case and that it is safe. Thank you so much for that call, Robert. We appreciate it. I'd like to bring you back in the conversation Dr. Nuss, because just knowing that we have this life-saving technology available, yet some people are still choosing to avoid it for whatever reason. Anybody 
has their own reason and, and we respect everybody's reason why. But, but talk about the impact that that has on the psyche of some of our nurses. What are some of the general feelings amongst nurses right now? Is it just exhaustion or is it anger, despair? Maybe give us some insight into your world, if you will. Yeah, so I think you bring up a great question. And as nurses, we try to be extremely compassionate. That's probably why we go into nursing is because we want to care for patients, but we're tired. We're exhausted, and it is frustrating when we know that there is a treatment out there that can help to minimize the disease. And so while our nurses are working very hard and still giving compassionate care, there is a little bit of frustration at times, not always, not by every nurse and not by every patient, but there certainly are some situations where it's just frustrating, especially when there are we have rules where patients on our COVID units their visitors must be vaccinated. And when we have visitors come across the hospital that want to come and visit, but they are not vaccinated and we cannot allow them to come in to visit, there's a lot of anger. And so that's one thing that I think our nurses are really struggling with right now is how angry people are um, when we start having discussions like this. Mm, yeah, the virus has brought out a lot of emotions from a lot of different people in many different ways. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the job market. We know how that's going across the country right now, but are we actually seeing nurses leave the profession? Is the number of new recruits similar to pre-pandemic years? What are some of the trends there? Um, we are seeing nurses leave the profession. We're definitely seeing nurses leave for traveling nurse positions across the country for um, quite a bit of an in, um, increase in salary. We are seeing, I wouldn't say we're seeing less nurses come out of nursing school and go into nursing. That's a good thing. But one trend that we've seen over the last year is that we have nurses leaving our organization within the first year of employment. So for example, our we call that first year turnover. And our first year turnover prior to the pandemic was about 12, maybe 13%. Last year, our first year turnover was 32%. Now, what happens with some of these new grads is they finished nursing school in the middle of the pandemic. And so their traditional education was hampered a little bit by COVID, but we're trying, we're working hard with our new graduates that we're hiring to give them the best and most solid orientation we can to help them be successful and not leave us within that first year. Wow, that, that's tough because we had a nursing shortage to begin with in this country. So it's hard to see the discouragement that has been brought on by the pandemic. Okay, we're gonna go back to the phones. Debbie from Ohio joins us now. Thanks for joining us, Debbie. Go right ahead. This question is for Dr. Gold. Um, I was watching two separate programs on two different days, and one expert um, said that COVID is here to stay, that it's not going anywhere. We're just going to have to learn to live with it. And the other expert said that they have... Um, went back in history and studied the pandemics that we've had previously and that they have a, I don't know what you want to call it. Uh, they, well, what they're saying is, is that these pandemics typically last three years and have three to four strains and then that's when they go away. So what I'm wanting to know is what Dr. Gold thinks about these two opinions and which he thinks is right. Thank you so much. Well, Debbie, it's a question for which there is not a clear answer right now because uh, we're living through a unique pandemic with a unique strain of virus. Uh, you know, when the initial name of a novel coronavirus was uh, first, you know, breached uh, almost uh, exactly two years ago now and shared widely across the media, should underscore the word novel because this is a different experience. This is not like influenza or RSV or other viruses that we've had a significant amount of experience with. But in answer to your question, this is, uh, you know, Jeff's opinion. Uh, <clears throat> we have lived with coronaviruses for a very long time. Uh, this novel coronavirus, the one, the SARS-CoV-2 virus and all of its mutants, is likely going to be around for a very, very long period of time. But the severity of it is likely going to continue to go down, and it's likely to become not pandemic, 
proportions, but what we call endemic proportions. That is to say that we will be living with it. Now, whether it will be severe enough to warrant an annual vaccination like we do for influenza remains to be seen. But the fact that it will be around and that we, our bodies are going to be capable of dealing with it, uh, I don't think there's any question that that's going to be the case long term. All right, Debbie, thank you so much for that call. Next, we're going to Florida. Nick joins us. Thanks for joining us, Nick. Go right ahead. Uh, hello, good evening. I'd like to ask the doctor uh, what, if any, differences there are uh, be for, between the antibodies from natural infection versus vaccination. Thank you. Nick, that's also a great question. <clears throat> so the antibodies that are raised due to vaccination all depend on the type of vaccine that we're using. So let's talk about the mRNA vaccines for a minute. Uh, the mRNA vaccines create a, a, a bit of protein that looks like a segment of the spike protein. So the, the, our body then makes antibodies specific uh, to that spike protein and also creates cellular immunity or long-term amnestic immunity to that unique section of the spike protein of the SARS-CoV-2, of the virus that causes uh, COVID-19. The benefit of that is we get a very intense reaction to that piece of critically important protein on the surface of the virus. The risk of that is if that piece of protein changes, as it has with Delta, and as it has even more so with Omicron, the vaccines become less significant, less powerful to prevent infection. Whereas the infection uh, and the Im response that we get from actually having uh, contracted the virus and having COVID, of course, creates antibodies to that piece of spike protein, but also creates multiple different types of antibodies to other parts of the virus, although significantly lower levels. So we develop antibodies to pieces of spike protein, to pieces of the capsule of the virus, to pieces of what's called the nucleocapsid of the virus, et cetera. So that underlies the fundamental difference between some of the earlier vaccines, which were either dead or attenuated virus vaccines. So think the very early polio days were uh, mimic viruses uh, and then attenuated virus vaccines in those early days. Uh, compared to these very sophisticated, very specific mRNA uh, and virus vector vaccines that produce very, very high antibody titers, but to very specific parts of the virus. So what we're doing is we're creating much more ammunition uh, against a very limited piece of the virus, as opposed to a broader, if you will, shotgun-like approach to different parts of the virus. So it's a critically uh, important trade-off. All right. Thank you so much for that call. That leaves a line open for you. We're going to take one more call before we go to break. Greg from West Virginia joins us now. Thanks for joining us, Greg. Go right ahead. Yes. I'd like to ask Dr. Gold, the people that are not getting refusing to get vaccinated or are not vaccinated, is that what may be helping more of these variances to be coming out? and the continuous we're fighting with this. Thank you. Uh, you're absolutely right, Greg, and of course, thank you for calling in from West Virginia. Uh, <clears throat> the more virus spread we have, the higher the virus load is. And you know, when we went from beta to delta variant last August, the number of virus particles that an individual would have in their airway went up 10,000 fold. 10,000 times more virus particles, which means that when you cough or when you sneeze, uh, you're expelling even more virus particles. And the more virus particles, the more mutation, the more mutation, the more chances that one of them is going to be successful, the same way Omicron became successful. The reason Omicron has replaced almost every other variant is because it's e much easier to transmit that virus. It catches on much faster inside of our nose and throat and mouth, it tends to populate our airways. Thankfully, it causes a less severe infection, but it's really good at replicating and really good at spreading, which means it's really good at causing mutations and new variants as well. Wow. 
Good question. Thank you so much for that call. That leaves a line open for you. 877-731-6733. Stay with us. More Rural Health Matters coming your way right after this. Welcome back to Rural Health Matters. Joining us once again is Dr. Jeffrey Gold, the Chancellor of the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And our special guest tonight is Dr. Sue Nuss. She serves as the Chief Nursing Officer at Nebraska Medicine. She has been on the front lines for the last two years during the pandemic. And you know, many of us have watched the news and felt optimistic at times that the pandemic would finally come to an end, especially after Delta was starting to wane, only to see it come roaring back again. How has that been on the mental health of our nurses? What are you noticing there, Dr. Nuss? Well, thank you for asking that question, Christina. We are noticing uh, definitely a change in the well being of our staff, and we're concerned about this fatigue. You know, early on in the pandemic, we heard about healthcare heroes and everyone was so excited about not just nurses, but physicians and paramedics and pretty much anyone in the healthcare field. And people were so excited and called everybody healthcare heroes. And now as this pandemic has gone on for two years, what I've heard some of the frontline staff mention is that we've been forgotten. We're still here, we're still caring for COVID, People are out and about. It's different than it was early in 2020, but we're not necessarily being viewed as the heroes anymore because of reasons that I mentioned earlier about having to stick to our guns, about not allowing uh, visitors that are not vaccinated to come and um, visit. And so it's just, um, it's weighing heavy on them. So what we're doing for their well being is we have a team, we have a couple teams actually, that help support our staff from our psychology department and our psychiatry department and our internal medicine department actually. And they meet with our staff and offer so, uh, support groups, focus groups. And um, also we have a peers in need of support group, which is where you can call this number and get um, connected with another peer and just talk through what your concerns are. But we are very concerned about the mental well-being of all of our healthcare providers right now. Uh, I think all of us just kind of had a reality check too. You're right. I mean, at the beginning, we were all saluting our healthcare professionals. And, and at this point, we're all just kind of so beaten and bruised by the pandemic itself. We all have pandemic fatigue. It's becoming more apparent at this two-year point. What's most concerning to you going into 2022 about the virus and, and where do you see the most promise? And I want to pose this question to both of you, but, but let's start with you, Dr. Nuss. Um, I'm hoping that the variant that Dr. Gold just mentioned, the potential new variant, is nothing like what either Delta or Omicron are. I'm hoping that we get to the other side of Omicron just as quickly as it went up. I'm hoping it goes down because what we're seeing now is that our staff are becoming infected even though they're vaccinated and boosted. And so our typical shortage is being stretched even more because we have our colleagues who are out because of um, need, needing to be isolated. So I hope for a resolution to this, that we come at the other side of this and we're not starting 2023 where we are now. That's what I hope for for this year. No, oh, you still have joy. I can see it in your eyes. And so I'm happy to see that you still have that glimmer of hope in your eyes. And yeah, mm -hmm. and we salute the medical community. We need to uh, all take a little bit more time to do that. Dr. Gold, same question for you. What's most concerning to you at this point about the pandemic and where do you see the most promise? Well, the concern really relates to the impact it has on the infrastructure of our communities. And by that I mean our teachers, uh, people that work in law enforcement, uh, people that drive our buses, trains, subways, uh, etc. And of course the frontline healthcare workers uh, who are critically important because they really determine the capacity of our healthcare system. And what's sometimes lost in this discussion, Christina, is that it's not just that our hospitals and intensive care units, as the graphics have shown, are filled with COVID patients, but that other patients, people that are having heart attacks and strokes, people that are delivering their babies, people that are, that are in need of life-saving surgery or uh, that need a joint replaced or, uh, or some other type of inpatient experience are limited uh, by lack of access to hospital beds, operating rooms, emergency rooms. You know, just to give you an example, uh, earlier today, uh, I mean, we were just completely full with a long list of patients 
from other hospitals that needed to be transferred for care that only we could deliver in, in the region that we support. Now, I'm sure through hospital discharges and other ways, and I'm hoping that Dr. Nuss will confirm this, that we were able to accommodate much of that. But having to say no to transferring rural hospitals, uh, having to say no to people that are, you know, in an emergency room somewhere uh, is something that we're just not doing. So we need to get beyond that. And the only way we're going to do that is, is through the, the use of the vaccines uh, for those that are not vaccinated and the use of the boosters uh, for those that are vaccinated. Having said that, I am also very optimistic that we're going to see this spike rise quickly and then fall relatively quickly. Uh, last week, we talked about several of the models that were uh, brought together, uh, predicting that by mid-March to uh, um, early to mid-March, we would be into a sort of baseline mode of the Omicron virus spread. Uh, and I'm also very optimistic that some of the science in terms of new drugs to treat these viruses, uh, new vaccines to prevent infection, and some of the things we've learned about care models such as air handling and personal protective equipment, that we can recall that and retain that information so that when and if we ever have to go through this again, uh, we can be much more rapid and much more flexible in ramping up and having surge capacity, as we call it, to deal with this to prevent some of the tragedy uh, that this pandemic has caused across our nation. Yeah. So I am very optimistic about the future. Unfortunately, it was trial by fire, but so many things were learned throughout this experience as well. So I really appreciate getting both of your perspectives on this. We're going to go back to the phones. Sherry of Florida joins us now. Thank you for joining us. Sherry, go right ahead. Thank you very much, Dr. Cool. I want you to know that I have had factor five in the blood clotting, and I would like to find out from you where am I stand, and I'm so afraid to even go and get a shot. Do you think that you could help me with this? Sure. <clears throat> My advice to all of our patients in our audience is always uh, to talk to your local health care professional. So for individuals such as yourself, so factor five is a blood clotting protein that is very important uh, in our ability for our blood to clot normally. We know without a doubt that COVID uh, has, the COVID infection now I'm talking about, has profound impact, imp uh, has a profound uh, impact on our ability to blood to clot. As a matter of fact, it, it tends to cause blood clotting. And so we know that particularly for critically ill patients, that putting them on a temporary blood thinner is a very important thing to do. Now, what that would mean to somebody that has had a factor V deficiency, such as yourself, is going to be very variable, particularly as it relates to the impact of COVID and possibly even to the selection of which vaccine, what the dose of that vaccine might be, et cetera. And so I would not want to generalize other than to say that individuals would have a much larger impact from being infected by COVID than you would potentially have from the safety of any of the vaccines, particularly for the mRNA vaccines. So my advice, Sherry, would be to contact your local healthcare professional, particularly the hematologist that you were working with who prescribed your Factor V uh, treatments, and find out from her or find out from him as to what the best recommendation would be for somebody uh, such as yourself. Thank you for that call, Sherry. We appreciate it. Judy of Texas is next. Thank you for joining us. Judy, go right ahead. Uh, my question is, uh, we have read a lot of the information and uh, any information we've gotten has not addressed I think you need to step away from your television set. Sometimes we get a little bit of a delayed feedback situation. So thank you so much for that call. And um, why don't you try stepping away from the TV set and calling us back? We're going to go to Kara of Georgia. Thanks for joining us, Kara. Go right ahead. Hi. Um, I'm in rural Georgia, by the way. Nice. <laughs> and I'm just calling to find out if the... COVID variant um, attaches to 
individuals who have cognitive disabilities or other um, disabilities such as autism or Angelman syndrome in particular, um, are they more susceptible to any of the COVID variants? So, Kara, uh, the answer is they're not more susceptible, but they tend to have more severe disease. Uh, they tend not, to, in some cases, depending upon how severe their developmental or intellectual disability is, uh, tend to have a higher need for hospitalization and, unfortunately, have had a higher mortality rate. I might ask Dr. Nuss what we've seen uh, from our patients. We have a large institute here known as the Monroe Meyer Institute for individuals with uh, intellectual and developmental disabilities. And I might ask Dr. Nuss if we've, what we've seen and what our experience has been in our units. Thank you for that opportunity or for asking that question, Dr. Gold. Um, I would agree with you. I don't think that we have seen any different impact to these, pe to these types of patients. So I would say that um, getting the vaccine would be the right thing to do to protect them just so that um, if there were a chance that they would get a more severe disease um, infection, that it wouldn't happen. But we have not seen that, um, that I know of. Okay, I think we have time for one more call. Let's get Jim from Pennsylvania on the line. Thanks for joining us, Jim. Go right ahead. Uh, do coronaviruses uh, form dormant stages uh, and uh, latent infections as uh, herpes virus do, or is it too early to tell yet? I think you put your finger right on it, Jim. I think it's too early to tell. Uh, typically, uh, other coronaviruses have not formed latent infections. However, they, they live with us. If you were to culture the inside of your mouth or nose, uh, I guarantee you that all of us carry small amounts of different types of coronaviruses. Whether this particular virus will have a different pattern, uh, only time will tell. But it would be unusual for a coronavirus to do that. All right. Thank you so much for that call. Thank you both for joining us. What a great show. We had a lot of great questions answered tonight. I want to thank you both, UNMC Chancellor Dr. Jeffrey Gold, Dr. Sue Nuss. Thank you so much for what you do for the nursing community, the entire nursing community in particular. I just want to tip my hat right now. I know when I had my baby, the nurses were with me most of the time, and then the doctor waltzed in for the last 20 minutes to an hour. So I know how hard you work. We tip our hats to you, and we just thank you both for looking out for our family members, for all our friends out there across rural America. So I want to thank everybody for joining us. Remember, we're going to be back here for you every Monday night at 5 p.m. Central Time right here on RFD TV with a brand new episode of Rural Health Matters for you. We've been here throughout the pandemic and we will continue to bring you these shows. And even after the pandemic, hopefully, I mean, if we can see out that far, we're hoping we will come to an end. This show will continue. We're going to continue to cover the medical topics that are important to you. And I want to make sure that you're aware of that. So Dr. Gold is here to stay. We will see you next week on Rural Health Matters right here on RFD TV. Thank you so much for joining us. In the meantime, to you, your family members and your friends, please stay safe out there and get those questions ready. 877-731-6733. That number never changes. And we look forward to hearing from you when we meet back here next week. Thanks again for joining us right here on RFD-TV.